Hey everybody, we're back with Pini Resnick from Container Solutions. Sadly, Pini decided to change out of his nice costume, which was basically a firefighter that was kind of brain okay and fire okay. But we're hoping he'll still give us a nice talk on SRE. How are you doing today, Pini? Doing well, yeah. I'll replace it with nice visuals. Good, glad. We're looking forward to this. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon or good morning if you are joining from US. And uh, uh, so first, just very shortly about myself, I'm uh, coming from development of uh, um, software configuration management, which is sort of uh, development operations or it's operations team embedded within the development. And I have done this for a very long time. And the last few years I'm, uh, uh, in container solutions, and I'm doing a lot of consulting. And I also this wrote this book, which you can actually download on our website uh, for free these days. So this will be about my personal journey from being a firefighter or doing operations uh, and waking up in the middle of the night, you know, fixing things, and all the way to sort of boring routine of uneventful maintenance. Um, so I will start with uh, one of the companies I worked with. I'm not going to mention the name. Um, it's actually quite a good company, but um, uh, yeah, I'll just use it as a sort of story. So in that company, when I joined, I joined software configuration management team, which was responsible to run internal development tools like Perforce, Jira, Jenkins, and a bunch of others, Confluence, and more and more and more, essentially development tools. And although the company was mostly in Europe, it was quite global. So the support was 24 seven. And we had about 1000 developers using these tools. So those are the customers. So our team was not fo uh, focusing on uh, external customers, but on this uh, thousand developers. What happened basically that when I came, the team was entirely overloaded with lots and lots of tasks all coming from the developers, from the customers. Now, most of the work was not automated, manual, and there was very little school service. Essentially, all these thousand developers was where they were most of the time entirely dependent on our work creating uh, a, a project in Perforce, creating uh, a project in Jira or space in, in Confluence or build in, in Jenkins, all of that was done by our team. And most of it was semi-manual, click, 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 click all over. So we would get something like 40 tickets uh, from, from those engineers. And essentially we were 100% on fire, right? just going through this routine firefighting all the time, right? Heroic firefighting. Things would fall apart and we would fix them. More tasks would come, we would fix them. And this sort of uh, vicious circle of just um, going through these 40 tasks a day, solving them, waking up at night, I don't know, every second week and fixing some uh, perforce server that went down. And there was no real time to improve anything. So essentially 100% reactive, 100% driven by external factors by the pressure from the, uh, from the development teams. And the pressure was, again, to create all kinds of things for them or uh, tools are not functioning or they're slow or some, some other things to fix or create but essentially nothing really to improve unless it's not functioning. So at that point when I came, it was obvious that it cannot continue like that. I mean, no, no, normally people cannot, I mean, you can work like that for years, but this is very, very unhealthy. So the idea was to basically change the, uh, the way we did things and become more, uh, uh, somehow stop this vicious cycle and move into more proactive mode. But unfortunately, 
all those issues were critical and without them, the development would stop. So we had to actually continue doing that. So if you continue doing 100% reactive stuff, you have no time to improve or automate anything. So there are three ways we could solve it. One is hire more people, automate and create more self-service and um, stop doing some tasks. So effectively, we, we have done all three and uh, we freed up about 50% of our time to actually do, uh, to start doing improvements. So first, we basically added more people. Uh, it was sort of lucky that the company was doing very well and we could double the team. So we had about seven or eight people, which really gave us a lot of free time. Um, but that, that wouldn't be enough. So what we also did is a lot of automation, a lot of tasks that uh, we were doing for others. We started uh, maintenance tasks or creation of all kinds of things. Uh, it's just automate and offload into self-service. So the developers should be able to create their own things without talking to us. But also very importantly, we stopped doing certain things. We started relying on those thousand developers to create their own projects, their own tasks, their own whatever is needed. I mean, they're reasonably trustworthy, right? So they can create a space and conference and a project in Jira. In worst case, if they're doing it wrong, we will delete it and create it again. But just by doing those things, the number of tasks actually went down to maybe 20 a day and we had more people. So what it allowed us is actually be much more proactive. Right? So instead of just fixing an error, or just restarting the server and making sort of make it work again, we started doing proactive changes. For example, uh, the Perfor server was not 100% uh, up, uh, up. So every night it would go down for about two hours to do backup. All kinds of things were very, it was actually massive, massive Perfor server. And Perfor, if you don't know, is like old kit, right? So uh, Perforce is known for like it, it's built in the way that you need to upload the entire source source code into RAM, the entire database essentially of source code in RAM. Otherwise, it's extremely slow. And our source code was over three hundred gigabytes, right? So we had to have a really really big server with a lot of RAM, very expensive, tens of thousands of euros. I think over fifty thousand euro, and uh, every 12 months or so, we had to buy another server just because we had no space to stick more RAM in it. So what we started doing is actually started to floating a lot of these things into ins like installing Perforce proxies, um, doing all kinds of uh, backups in, in the background, um, maintaining tools much better. So essentially solving the problems that created a lot of noise. So um, now that company, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, but I left that company. So the rest of the story is not related to them. And I really hope they continued on, on that journey and continued fixing things uh, further. But instead of looking into that company, so we can look around and see what the other industry is actually doing in this case. So let's say you have, boats, cars, planes, uh, houses, right? How they are doing maintenance. I mean, of course there is the firefighting. So if something is broken, it's, it's going to be fixed. And of course there's proactive improvements in every industry. Um, but what really happens, and this is the car dashboard, a car dashboard with all the possible icons of uh, uh, essentially cars, talk to us, right? They tell us what's wrong. What's wrong or what's going to be wrong soon. So I, I cannot tell you exactly which one is saying what, but when those things jump at us, we basically know we need to go to the garage or we need to stop by the road or we need to fill, the, fill some uh, gas, right? A very good example of this is, this is basically an observability of a car. The car is built in the way that it tells us when something is wrong. And this is a very good example of how it tells us is it says the fuel is low, right? So 
but it doesn't tell us we have no fuel after the car already stopped and it has no fuel, right? It, it's basically useless to tell us that the system is down because we already know it's down. I mean, it's not driving, right? It's like, I mean, I'm, I'm sending and it cannot go anywhere and I cannot go to the uh, gas station to actually fill in the fuel, right? So that's why cars tell us that they are going to be out of fuel about 70 kilometers before they actually uh, run, out of, uh, run out of it. So the observability is really, um, it's about telling us what's happening before it's too late. But there is something else that other industries are doing. And this is again, example from cars, but any other mature industry doing the same. They're periodic inspections. This is an example of a, a, a car manufacturer. They basically tell you, if you want us to support your car, you have to take it to the garage every 10 or 20,000 kilometers or every year or two years or whatever, there's a specific schedule. And we're going to, check your car, there's a specific checklist, and we're going to replace things that are not yet broken, right? It's very important. I mean, we commonly hear in software, if something ain't broken, don't fix it, right? This is not true. Actually, we routinely replace components that are not yet broken, but they have lifespan. And we know that if we don't replace them, a massive damage is going to happen. There is this belt in the engine, whatever it's called, I'm not a mechanic, if you don't replace it after a certain period of time, and if it, if it breaks, then the entire engine needs to be rebuilt, which is thousands and thousands of thousands in damage, while the belt itself is maybe only, I don't know, 50 or 100 euro. In addition, there are government inspections, right? Not just the car manufacturer, but also the government are forcing us to put the car every year, every two years in a, uh, a special place where they will check all these things that actually the car is safe to drive for the driver, passengers, and other people on the road. All this is called preventive maintenance, right? Preventive maintenance means that um, there are periodic uh, inspections and there is replacement of components that are actually not yet broken. Now, we don't really do this kind of things in software, right? We're not really inspecting the software normally and checking what's going on. Let's, uh, let's see if it's still functional. Maybe we need to improve something. Maybe we need to replace the build system with another build system. Maybe some servers running out of RAM or something like that. This is not a common practice in our industry. We also don't replace components unless there is a pain, right? In cars, when you go and check up the car, it's uh, you're going to replace oil and all kind of lights and whatever other things are being replaced every year without them being broken, right? This is essential part of ongoing maintenance. And what's going to happen if you don't do ongoing maintenance, right? If you wait until a major uh, failure happens, then you need to do major repair. And major repair is very expensive, right? Um, of course, you're not waiting until the car is entirely unusable, right? But once the engine falls apart or something breaks, then you go to a garage and you fix it. But fixing an engine is thousands of euros. Alternatively, what you can do is you see minor repairs. So minor repairs will become major repairs later. But if you, fi if you don't fix them in time, right? They will lead to major uh, failures which will lead to major repairs and it will cost you significantly more. What preventive maintenance does is just addressing normal wear and tear, right? So every component you know, it wears off, right? It, it becomes, um, uh, it, it's always on the way being basically getting broken, right? And we want to replace them and maintain them. This is also very common in, uh, for example, airline, airlines or airplanes, they are tested or checked up before every flight. They are also uh, repaired or so some components are replaced after a certain number of flight hours or some periods. So this is common in every mature industry. So what are uh, 
the things that actually can reduce the cost of maintenance and, and important. I'm not going to go into detail in each one of them, but just briefly show the things that can improve the quality of the software we're building. So first, obviously, it's construction quality, right? So if you build things right, they will live for longer and they will fall apart less, they will break less. It's quite obvious. Observability, same as cars and other things. We need to know if something is working or not working, but not just when it's broken or after it breaks, breaks down, but actually before it breaks down, we need to know what's going on in the system. We need to feel that the car is still driving, the software is still functional, it still does the work and it needs to be before it's too late. Very important uh, for successful maintenance is being able to replace components. And not just with similar components, exactly the same components, but also comparable ones. So if there are standards in, uh, in cars, for example, if you have like a, a wiper, then you can put alternative wiper, a cheaper one from another vendor. But if the connections between different components are reasonably standardized, it's quite easy to take one that is not functional anymore, not providing the right value, replace with another one, which is better or cheaper or more relevant for whatever reason. This is something that I haven't seen too much in software development. Not that I haven't seen it ever. It does happen periodically, but most of the software development or maintenance teams don't do any inspections or they don't have any checklists or procedures to check the stuff that is already running in production. Whatever is running and working well is great. But there is no scheduled, periodic scheduled uh, inspections that lead to uh, proactive or pre preventive maintenance. The other thing is that if you, there is this car, I think Rover, that to replace lights, front lights, you need to uh, replace the, or remove the engine which is crazy, right? It means that it's just so much work to replace parts. And in many cases in software, you cannot access the part that you need to replace unless you stop the entire system or you do something very complicated. Upgradability is quite obvious. There's this tendency, especially in the world of cloud native and, and new fancy development tooling, right? To, to use all kinds of new things. But if you use known tools, you know how to maintain them. They're predictable. And there is value to that. So they reduce cost of maintenance. Um, and we really don't want to, to rely on perfection of any single component. It's always better to have failover rather than saying that this component will never, never ever fail and as a result, also degradation of service. And if you go to sort of next level, there are also emergency drills and uh, chaos engineering and error budgets and SLAs and SLOs and all kinds of different other things. Those are important. Those are the new tools that you cannot do in cars. You don't want to do chaos engineering when you're driving a car, but we can afford doing it in distributed software systems because of the old failovers and different, uh, uh, the capability of the software to basically survive the, this error. Because when we're driving the car, of course, we don't want to you know, randomly blow up the tire. That, that's not commonly used practice. The last point is, and this is coming from a really good book called How Buildings Learn from About Real Buildings. It's basically um, a really good practice when you build something is problem transparency as design goal. What it means is that you need to know that something is broken before it's broken. Like it smells bad or it looks bad or it doesn't do something right, but it's not yet too late to fix it. So uh, again, from the same book, is the thing is that there is no, just 
I'll just read it, right? Maintenance is all about negatives, never about rewards. Doing it as a pain, not doing it can be catastrophic. But essentially there is no, you're not winning, right? Essentially, if you are doing maintenance right, then bad things will not happen. And no one will ever know that they didn't happen. So there are no prizes, there are no winners. There is nothing amazing, there are no achievements. It's just boring, it's just not happening. But with all that, accidents will still happen. If you don't know, this is the, the airplane that was landed on Hudson, super successful, and, and we still need the heroes, right? So the firefighting and heroic actions and saving the system will still be, be, will still be required, just not all the time. And before I finish, I'll tell you one last story, uh, again, about my own sort of development of, uh, of this uh, moving from reactive to preventive maintenance. So this is the extension of my, my house. So it's basically at the end of the house is this structure. Uh, it's from wood and, and glass. And one day we see drops of water it's a wooden uh, beam, right? So it's, it's not what you want to see as a leak in this kind of thing. Okay, the first action is this. Take a piece of masking tape and stick it on, on the leak. That's a reactive fix, right? I mean, it fixes the thing, but we, it's very, very obvious. This is not going to lead for, you know, for a real solution. So looking from the top, you can easily see the root cause. And the root cause is that the, the wood was rotten. And the real root cause, because it wasn't painted. We bought this house some years ago, and before that, it wasn't painted for many more years before that. So essentially, no one was painting for maybe eight or 10 years. And uh, that's the result, right? So then a proactive fix is just do the fucking paint, right? paint it, and it's going to be fixed. But if we go the next step, which I haven't done yet because this whole story happened about six months ago, is that the real solution is to inspect this thing every six months or so, and then put another layer of paint every two or three years. If you do that, you will never need to rebuild the, the structure. So essentially, the best way to waste 10,000 euro on rebuilding this whole thing uh, is by saving 30 euro and two hours of work just painted, right? And in software, we see it every day. You want to build another unit test, you want to do some maintenance task, you would put, put, uh, put in place a piece of automation, but you are too busy. This is exactly the same story. It's just sticking the piece of masking tape and forgetting about this. And if you want to know more about SRE, uh, then you can come over to our booth and, uh, and hear the full story how SRE actually implements uh, reactive, proactive, and preventive maintenance. And thank you. Thank you, Pini. That was great. I love the real life examples. Are people also going to meet you at our booth? I can, yes. I will be there, yes. Perfect. Are we looking on questions, Domi? Uh, yeah, I think we have... Uh, well, well, one was more of like a comment and the other one was a question. So I'll start with a comment. Um, well, I'll start with a thank you for the talk. That was great. <laughs> so it's always a good thing. Um, Oh, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, so let's just go into the remark that was sent on the on the chat fairly fairly early in your talk. Was that Alexander D. Jensen said three hundred gigabytes of source code? Question mark exclamation mark. So that was the comment. <laughs> I can explain this. I mean, yeah, people submit binary artifacts to source code, which blows it up, and it's not a good practice, but that's what it is. And it is a big company, right? So. And it's old big company with lots and lots and lots of stuff. 
it's actually not that difficult to get to 300 gigabyte of source code. And it's a bit of perforce false, false. It's <laughs> not very good in managing that kind of things. That is, that's fair enough. Um, we have, so we have another question. I think we have one more and then hopefully if anybody has any more questions watching, please add them to the chat now. There's a bit of a delay, so bear with us. <laughs> Um, there was another question. Do you want to take that one, Charlotte? Sure. The question is, was there a product feature dev team velocity hit? That's a long thing. When tasks were moved to devs, were dev teams also allowed to increase hiring to account for additional tasks? Can you repeat the first complex part you said? Was there a product feature dev team velocity hit? Okay, I'll try to answer something that I understand from, from this. And if, if this is the wrong answer, then you can correct me. Um, the thing is that adding new people to teams is not directly related to increase of work of that team often, but to a bit budget available. And there's quite significant disconnect from, the, from those things. So it means that when there is more work for a team, they need to work harder often. And there is no way to hire more people. So it means that hiring only happens when uh, there is a need, there is a budget, but also it's especially difficult for this kind of non-functional teams like development support, right? Because they don't produce any features. And generally companies don't like investing in this kind of things. I think also in that specific companies, for team for people team probably would be enough if the systems would be fully automated and well functioning, right? So increasing it to eight people maybe wasn't the best, best solution, but there was no other real choice because we were stuck with a lot of manual work and there was no way to break out from the vicious circle. Hopefully that was the question that I was answering. I, I believe so. I think that was a good answer. I think we're out of questions. I do have one more. Is there a recommended amount of time for people to spend on preventive maintenance? It's difficult to say. I mean, I put it as sort, 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 but it doesn't really mean that. Um, the thing is that more you put in preventive maintenance, less you will need to firefight. But if you look in, again into traditional industries like cars or planes or houses, well-maintained maintained houses almost never break down. Right? Well-maintained cars can drive on the road for 15 years almost without breaking down. But only if you do preventive maintenance, if you go through all the checkups and you replace the parts before they break down. So theoretically speaking, you can get to the point that you only do pre uh, preventive maintenance. But I have never seen that. And I think in real life, it's not practical, not with software. Yeah, I, I think that's that's fair. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I keep on top of mind is everything is going to break eventually, but you also have to make sure that if, if you know, like if you've put everything in place to make sure that it doesn't happen as fast as it would Otherwise, then um, yeah, that's it's um, that's absolutely fair. Um, cool. Kind of, Sorry, go on. Just to finish the thought is that uh, there are all kind of principles to reduce the the, the pain, right? So the, the there's gradual degradation of service. So things are not catastrophically fail, right? Like a, a human, right? If you cut your finger, you don't drop dead, right? It, it's like well, I mean, I've seen right? people. <laughs> 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 there are all kinds of things that you can build. The systems need to be designed in a way. So this SRE is not a solution. If you just introduce a SRE team to do preventive maintenance on the system that they don't see what's, go what's going on inside and there are no checklists and there is no procedures and there is no collaboration with the development team, they cannot do their job, right? There is no, I mean, the cars, the only reason you can do the periodic inspection is because it's fairly standardized. Actually, it's very, very standardized. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's like every year a car has to be checked and you have to have your little, um, you know, like your certificate with your MOT or um, APACA or whatever it's called in the, everywhere, <laughs> everywhere else. Yes. Um, but yeah, those, those things are important. And I think um, we're getting to a place where it's somewhat more embedded into people's, uh, you know, plans. Um, but yeah, like a, I think we should get to a, like a yearly or at least a yearly or a quarterly regular MOT kind of thing for people's um, <laughs> T systems. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, even if we don't have a specific procedure yet, just once a year reviewing the system and checking that everything is still right is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, not really done in software. No, but we should. I I th- okay so I, th- I, c- I think i could like talk about this for a long time but i believe it's time for a bunch of other things Vinny, thank you so much for for doing this talk with us today mm-hmm. and um yeah well if, if anybody wants to speak to him further you can join him in the uh, yes. uh, container solutions booth or on the chat or on yes. all of the other social medias <laughs> all the other places thank you very much and uh, and have the rest of the truck successful rest of the truck